Morning, everyone. We start today with concerns over pension funds following a warning from the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, where he ruled out extending the help they've been giving. That news caused the pound to plunge in overnight trading on Asian markets. It dipped against the dollar to $1.09. This morning, though, we're hearing one report that the Bank of England has been privately briefing that it will continue with its interventions beyond Friday. All that as the latest growth figures are revealed. Let's get more, should we? Paul standing by for us. Uh, Paul, what's the latest? Good morning to you. Yeah, good morning, Kay. Uh, the latest is bad news uh, for the economy. In August, the latest GDP figure, that's the size of the economy, the growth in the economy, well, it contracted. The economy got smaller, fell by uh, minus 0.3%. In August. Now, that tallies with the predictions we've had from the Bank of England. Its forecast is that the UK will be entering a recession in this quarter, that is starting now in October, but already the figures for August, the end of summer, showing a contraction. There was a bank holiday in that month, which may have contributed uh, to slightly less economic activity. Uh, but this is a sign of the headwinds in which this new government is operating. Of course, businesses already facing perhaps contraction in the economy know they're going to face much higher borrowing costs as a consequence of the market turmoil in the last few weeks. Back in August, of course, they were looking at energy bills and not knowing quite what the government was going to do about it. Well, they know that now. But the challenge here for businesses is to try and keep going. And we know the labour market is, is not keeping up. There are more vacancies, we discovered yesterday, in the economy than there are unemployed people to do them. A record number of people off sick. So a great deal of pressure on the economy. And the challenge for a government which wants to be measured by growth is that we get a measure every month. And today, the measure is the economy is contracting. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. Thanks. Uh, Jacob rees mogg Secretary of State for Business, is uh, with us this morning. Quick thought on that to start with, please. Um, figures that are released immediately are very often revised. So the previous quarter's figure showed a contraction, was then revised to show economic growth. So be very careful about how you interpret figures immediately after their release. OK, so we shouldn't take too much notice of that figure. It, it's a, a small amount of a very large economy, but these figures are notorious for being... Um, revised afterwards. Are our pension funds at risk? Uh, no, our pension funds aren't at risk. Um, some pension funds have taken some high-risk investments. Um, Andrew Bailey um, said that um, in three days' time, Friday, um, pension funds uh, that he has been trying to support by the Bank of England, he will withdraw the emergency help for that. How concerned are you by, by that language? Um, the question is not, not many-fold, really. That first of all, there's the issue of the relatively high-risk investments that some pension funds have made, that they were gearing on their gilt holdings. And the problem with gearing is that when values change, if they change sharply, which has been a phenomenon with gilts because of the change in interest rates. So the underlying base rate has gone up significantly in this country and globally. And therefore, you've seen long rates move out. Um, and that's been happening here as elsewhere. That's had an effect on pension funds. But there's also a valuation issue. Um, with long-term gilts, many pension funds will be holding them for their full duration. We'll be expecting to get them redeemed at the end of 30 years, but maybe on an obligation to mark them to market. If they're marking them to market, they may find that they have actually a false valuation on investment that's intended to be held to maturity. I'm sure that my uh, viewers, my audience, got almost all of that, but the bottom line is that Andrew Bailey thought it was um, in concerning enough to offer emergency help that will be withdrawn, he says, on Friday, I'm saying to you, how concerned should we be that the Governor of the Bank of England, in his very important job, has said, come Friday, they're on the road? Well, the Bank of England is obviously operationally independent, and that's quite right. And the Governor will make decisions in accordance with the markets. But the Bank of England does have a responsibility, and has had a responsibility for a very long time, uh, to ensure the orderly functioning of markets. And therefore, it intervenes from time to time when there are unexpected events. When does it become the government's problem? Well, the government and the Bank of England work very closely together within the confines of the independence of the Bank of England. The, the Bank of England is quite rightly operationally independent, and you will remember all the arguments over this about why it was better to have an independent interest rate yep. setter. Um, but nonetheless, economic decision-making involves both the Bank of England and the government. So the two, the two work together 
in the confines of independence of the bank. But you don't think it's a problem with the, with the, the pensions, and the Bank of England does? Uh, no, the Bank of England has made its position clear that it's been helping because of a specific problem. What I was answering was whether there is a systemic problem in pension funds, which there doesn't seem to be. Are there problems with some pension funds that have taken risky investments, which the Bank of England is helping with? Yes, these are two separate questions. Should they continue with their help post-Friday? I shouldn't intervene in matters where the Bank of England operates into independently. OK, well, I'm reading the FT this morning, which is suggesting that privately the Bank of England is saying that it will support beyond Friday. Um, is that the Governor potentially stoking up anxiety unnecessarily? You must interview the Governor. It would be quite what wrong. What do you think? No, look, I'm a government minister. The Bank of England is independent. I think the Bank of England independence is fundamental to the stability of the UK economy. And I think government ministers therefore have no business um, wading in on what the Bank of England is, is doing. But the if, Bank, if the Bank of England has independence. Yeah, I understand that. But if the Bank of England is saying, the Andrew Bailey is saying one thing in public and one thing in private, and that is impacting the markets, that's impacting our economy, which is impacting the government. Y you must interview Mr Bailey. What's your view? No, I'm not going to criticise the Bank of England uh, or the governor. You that it's it, not for me to speculate on what the Bank of England is doing. Do you have it confidence is, in it? It is in, yes, of course I've got confidence in the Government Bank of England. It is so important that we have an independent Bank of England with a respected governor. Andrew Bailey is a respected governor and the Bank of England's independence is operating as it should. He must make the decisions in relation to um, market support, and for ministers to interfere would be undermining the independence of the Bank of England. He doesn't which... have much confidence in the government. He says the situation with the economy is way beyond anything the bank has uh, stress-tested for. Uh, well, the Bank of England's stress test should be there to uh, ensure the Bank of England is ready for whatever happens within the economy. But you shouldn't be surprised by some of the moves. Um, markets do move quickly. And we have had the lowest level of interest rates in history, not just in decades, not just since um, 1970 or any of those figures, but in the whole of our economic history, we have had consistently the lowest rates. Now, that was always going to change at some time. Should and it change it, sooner? And when it changes, it changes on the long rate more than it does on the short rate, usually, for obvious reasons. Should it have changed sooner? Well, Interest rates are set independently by the Bank of England, but they're also set by the markets. So the markets determine when long rates move rather than it being set by the Bank In of England. In your opinion, you're a very successful businessman, you know a lot about the markets, as you've already illustrated. Do you think interest rates should have gone up sooner? Again, the Bank of England is independent, so I'm going to keep my private views private. Um, it's certainly had an impact on people's mortgages, hasn't it? Um, what impact has it had on your mortgage? Well, I've never thought that my personal financial circumstances, but we could discuss yours as well, are... are well, my mortgage has gone up. Well, what about yours? Um, mortgage rates have gone up for everybody who has a mortgage, and I have a mortgage, but my personal financial circumstances, I don't think are um, ones to draw general you conclusions from. And, and I, I did, and, yeah, and I answered, told you. And I've answered, and we, we've both had mortgages that have go up, gone up. And so, has your mortgage gone up now? All, 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 any floating rate mortgages have gone up. Has, has yours? Yes, mine has gone up. OK. Um, do you think benefits should go up in line with inflation? But we haven't yet had the inflation figure on which benefits will be set. So that is something that will be decided once the figure is available. Well, well you, we know that you can predict these things very successfully. Um, we we'll also have the help of many other very clever people who are saying that inflation will go up about 10%. Well, you, you, you whereas say... Whereas wages will go up about 5.2%, something like that. You say you can predict these things. Actually, most predictions, most economic forecasts, uh, turn out to be inaccurate rather than spot on. So one's got to be careful about forecasts. As I was saying earlier, with the GDP figure... Well, inflation's going to go up more than um, wages, isn't it? Lots of figures that come out get revised later. But I think the broad point you're making, that inflation will rise more than wages uh, this year, is accurate. And to that end, should benefits go up in line with inflation? But there's a process for making this decision. This decision will be made once the figures come out. A statutory instrument has to be laid in November um, to put through the increase. That will be done in the normal way. This is completely routine governmental decision-making. It's a decision made by the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. That will be made in the normal way. Yeah, but what's your opinion? My opinion is government policy. 
I'm not sitting here as a commentator for a journal or a backbench MP. I'm sitting here as a member of the government where there is a decision-making process. The discussions on how things should be managed are ones that need to take place in private before a government policy is announced, for which we are then accountable to Parliament. I, I think to um, discuss I think this and he thinks that and she thinks the other it is not a good way of making government policy. No, but surely, given the situation that many people are finding themselves in at the moment and relying on benefits, they need to be reassured that they will get benefits increased in line with inflation. Well, quite a number of benefits will increase in line with inflation by law anyway. Mm. So there's a subset of benefits um, where a decision will be made and the triple lock for pensioners uh, will remain um, in uh, full um, state that that will be applied. I spoke to the Deputy Prime Minister yesterday. She said that the um, economy is in a good state. Do you think it is? Well, I think the um, economy has some good points and some areas of difficulty. So you were reporting that uh, the employment market remains very strong, uh, with vacancies being lower uh, than um, the... Sorry, vacancies being higher than mm. the a number of people unemployed. But there is a problem with inflation. And the difficulty with inflation is that to deal with inflation, monetary policy has to tighten. And tightening monetary policy leads to higher mortgages and higher rates of interest for businesses. And that is never easy. It would be wrong of me to pretend that that is easy. So it's not in a good state? There are bits of it that are in a good state. So, as I said, employment, which is fundamental to people because employment is the far and away best route out of poverty, um, is in a very strong state, but inflation is not, and that is creating problems. Yeah, OK. Um, but we go back to what Andrew Bailey was saying, and he says the economy is way beyond anything the bank has stress-tested for. So, you know, he doesn't think it's in a particularly good state, does he? Well, he's responsible for monetary policy, and the bank has been putting interest rates up um, as a consequence of, of inflation. The Bank of England stress tests are matters for the Bank of England. Uh, we asked the Deputy Prime Minister as well yesterday about proposed change to the affordable um, houses target. Um, she wasn't aware that there was a proposed change. Are you aware of it? Um, I'm aware that there is a discussion, but I'm not aware of the decision having been made. Should we look at um, potentially not having as many affordable houses for people to live in? I, I, I think it misses the dynamism of the market, that what matters is the total housing stock, because people move and therefore you increase the yeah, total... To start, that's right. They? But by increasing the total housing stock, you find that houses at other parts of the market become affordable and therefore you create a dynamic system. I think the idea that there are houses that are affordable and houses that are unaffordable is not necessarily the right way of looking at it. You've got to say, affordable for whom and under what circumstances? And then there's a question, not of affordable housing, but of social housing and what provision are you making there? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think there's a what, too what great a tendency yeah. to look at the housing market as if it's static when it's dynamic, and that leads to potentially discussing issues that don't fundamentally change where people live, well, which I is what really matters. I suppose people who are not earning uh, particularly high salaries like nurses would be looking for uh, their first um, starter home and affordable housing to them would be very different to potentially affordable housing for me. Yesterday, Therese Coffey said there's no more money to uh, pay nurses uh, a pay increase and as a result, they are not as a direct result of what she said, but they want more money and they're going to go on strike for the first time in more than 100 years. Um, the pay round this year has already started being difficult, and we're aware of that. That's an obvious concomitant of inflation, that when inflation rises, then people, understandably, uh, ask for higher wages, but those are not necessarily affordable. And the um, issue here is how do you deal with the inflationary problem? Uh, that is mainly the monetary policy of the Bank of England, but that if you raise wages fully in line with inflation. You get into the uh, issue of wage push inflation and continue the inflationary that problem. That may, may well be it, the case, and I'm sure it is, but, you know, if you can't afford to feed your kids, you want more money, don't you? Ultimately, the taxpayer has limited resources and we have to live within our means. So how much is available for um, public services depends on economic growth, which is why the government's policy is pushing for economic growth. And actually, the IMF yesterday predicted that following 
the fiscal statement, there would be more growth next year than it had previously forecast. Yeah. If there's more growth, then there's more tax revenues, then there's more money for everybody involved. In the meantime, to those that just two years ago we were standing on our doorsteps clapping for? Uh, well, uh, look, the, the, the wage round this year is part of a negotiation. That negotiation will continue. But the taxpayer ha has limited money. Everything that is done by government has to be funded by taxpayers, either this year or in future if it's done through borrowing. There is not an unlimited amount of money, and governments always have to work within that. What should we do about the coronation? How much should we spend on the coronation next year? Well, uh, um, I don't have a specific figure for how much we should, should it be a cut spend. Price coronation? Um, we don't have coronations very often. Uh, I think the key to the coronation, actually, is that it's a religious ceremony. It is effectively a sacrament. The last anointed monarch uh, in Europe, um, other arguably than the Pope, um, with a ceremony that dates back to Anglo-Saxon times. So we can find um, money I think, for that, but I th not for this. I, I, I think it was um, uh, Dunstan, St Dunstan of, Ca of um, Glastonbury, uh, who really devised the coronation. Um, no, because the costings are entirely different. That's it all comes from the public purse, doesn't it? No, no, no. It? One is a small one-off amount in the context of government expenditure. Um, pay rates are billions of pounds. Nobody's talking about a coronation that will cost billions of pounds. How much should it cost? To put a precise figure on it uh, is not, at, not for me to do. If it was to be but... comparable with the previous one, it would be something like 46 million quid. Uh, that's what it equates to now from 1953 well, costs. Well, it depends how you account for it. Um, uh, I hope we see um, a coronation that is sufficiently dignified for our sovereign. This is a one-off cost. The last one um, was for a coronation for a reign of 70 years. So this is not something that happens often. It needs to be done properly. And it's completely irrelevant to um, pay rates because £46 million would not buy you an increase in pay for people employed in the public service of any amount at all, as you know. It's good to talk to you as always. It's always thank a pleasure. You thank you very you much. Us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's have a quick look at what's happening as far as the newspapers are concerned this morning. Here we go. And let's start with the Financial Times, should we? Here we go. That's the FT for you, the Bank of England's guilt buying operation, which they say was to prevent fire sales by pension funds. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Telegraph, meanwhile, focuses on the falling value of the pound in response to the bank uh, pulling the plug on their guilt-buying programme. The I reports on the government's plans to cap the profits of renewable and nuclear energy generators in a bid, it says, to silence the rebels. The Guardian calls the proposed cap a windfall tax and label it uh, another U-turn from Liz Truss. The Express leads with details of King Charles' slim-down coronation. The paper says the decision was made to reflect the cost-of-living crisis gripping the country. Still to come on the programme for you this morning, we'll have the very latest on the NHS. We'll hear about the British Medical Association worries that medics are leaving the NHS uh, when I talk to Dr Shanu Datta, the Deputy Chair of the BNI Consultants Committee. We'll hear from the photographer of uh, this picture, Anand Nambia, who will join me later this hour to talk about winning the Behaviour Mammals category of the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award. Apparently there is. There you go. There's a snow leopard there. They're very well camouflaged. And next hour, I'll be talking to Lisa Nandy, uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Uh, just got reaction from the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, on those latest GDP statistics. Uh, countries around the world are facing challenges right now, particularly as a result of high energy prices driven by Putin's barbaric action in Ukraine. That is why this government acted quickly to put in place a, com a comprehensive plan to protect families and businesses from soaring energy bills this winter. Our growth plan will address the challenges that we face with ambitious supply-side reforms and tax cuts, which will grow our economy, create more well-paid skill jobs and, in turn, raise living standards for everyone, almost as if 
he planned that before we got the figures. Now, still to come, NATO's defence ministers are meeting this morning in Brussels to discuss ways to support Ukraine after increased Russian missile strikes in the capital, Kiev, and 12 other cities this week. The US President Joe Biden said late last night that he doesn't think his Russian counterpart will be using a tactical nuclear weapon in the war on Ukraine. I think he is a rational actor who's miscalculated significantly. I think he thought, uh, you, may, you may recall, I pointed out that they were going to invade, that all those 100,000 or more troops there, and no one believed that he was going to invade Ukraine. You listen to what he says. If you listen to the speech he made after when that decision was being made, he talked about uh, the whole idea of he was needed to be the leader of Russia that united all his objectives. Were not, I think he thought... Jake, I think he thought he's going to be welcome with open arms. From Brussels, uh, Deborah, standing by for us now, our security and defence editor, of course, who was with us in the studio yesterday, hot-footed it to Europe straight after. Uh, bring us up to date, if you would, please, Deborah. Good morning. Good morning. So here today at the NATO headquarters, which is just behind me, you're going to have defence ministers from the 30 NATO countries meeting and also uh, members of a US-led grouping that have um, gathered since Russia's war in Ukraine began, that they gather as a, as a kind of forum to um, agree new weapons to give to Ukraine. The Ukrainian president yesterday, um, speaking to G7 leaders, urged for more weapons to help help him protect his skies and there have been devastating missile strikes by Russia against Ukrainian cities. Um, the first major barrage was on Monday, a real escalation. It seems to have been uh, Russia's response to this explosion um, on the 8th of October on a bridge connecting the Crimean Peninsula that was illegally annexed by Russia back in 2014 with the Russian mainland. And I can bring you some new information that's just emerged from the FSB Russian Security Service um, about that attack. They're accusing the main intelligence directorate of Ukraine's defence ministry of being behind the attack. They've released some details about what they say is their investigation into the explosion on that bridge, saying that it was um, uh, in a, on a truck bomb, um, accusing uh, a number of individuals of having been involved. Um, and they said that five Russian nationals and three Ukrainian citizens and an Armenian have been arrested as part of their investigation. Ukraine has not admitted responsibility for that explosion. OK, for now, Deborah, thank you very much. Thank you. Looking at some of today's other headlines for you now, MPs have urged all women aged 45, over 45, um, be invited for an NHS health check so doctors can talk to them about the menopause. The all-party parliamentary group on menopause has said that far more needs to be done to help women and offer advice, including making hormone replacement therapy prescriptions free on the NHS and improving training for medics on symptoms. Riot police have fired into residential neighbourhoods in Sanandaj, the capital of Iran's Kurdistan province, as Amnesty International and the White House's National Security Advisor criticised the violence targeting demonstrators angered by the death of Masa Amini. Meanwhile, oil workers joined the protest for the first time linking an industry key, Iran's theocracy, to the unrest. Netflix has signed up to the TV ratings agency BAM, meaning its audiences will now be measured externally. From November, viewing figures for this, uh, the streaming giant will be reported by the organisation, which complies, uh, compiles rather audience measurement and TV ratings in the UK. Also this morning, one of the last surviving stars of Hollywood's golden age, Angela Lansbury, has died at the age of 96. Whether you remember her Murder, She Wrote, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, or as the maternal teapot in Disney's Beauty and the Beast, hers was a, a career that uh, spanned generations. Born in 1925 in Regent's Park, the British-born actor found fame after fleeing the London Blitz to the US. Sky's Matthew Thompson looks back now on her life and career. It 
it was one of the most successful shows in television history. And yet, Murder, She Wrote was just one of many successes in Angela Lansbury's 70-year career. Born in London in 1925, she found early fame as one of the stars of Hollywood's golden age. Awards and nominations flooded in and never really stopped. She became one of the most decorated stage actors in history with five Tony Awards. Tale as old as time, true as it can be. Roles in Disney classics like Beauty and the Beast endeared her to a younger generation. When I'm in a supermarket or something, a kid will say to her mother, that's Mrs. Potts. Tale as old as time, song as old as rhyme, beauty and the bee. It will be a death mourned in Hollywood, Broadway, the West End and beyond, as a true legend takes her final bow. Good night, love. Angela Lansbury, who has died at the age of 96. Floods of tributes for her have come in overnight, including this tweet from the actress Viola Davis, who said, you have influenced generations of actors to aspire to excellence. Thought you would live forever. What an absolutely beautiful legacy you've left. You have influenced generations of actors to aspire to excellence. Rest well. May flights of angels. West End legend Elaine Page shared this photo of the pair, calling Angela one of the last golden age of Hollywood stars and a Broadway and West End icon. So upset to hear the news that the legendary dame Angela Lansbury has died, one of the last golden age of Hollywood stars. The crowning of King Charles and the Queen Consort, Queen Camilla, will take place on the 6th of May. Buckingham Palace says that the ceremony will be rooted in long-standing traditions, but also reflect the monarch's role today and looks towards the future. Let's uh, get more, should we? Uh, taking you to Westminster Abbey now, and uh, Laura is uh, joining us. Um, hey, Laura, good morning to you. Hearing from Jacob Rees-Mogg a short time ago, he said we should uh, spend as much as it takes to celebrate the coronation. Lots of questions about that and there'll be lots of thoughts about that in the planning process. What we do now know is obviously the date and the venue is always going to be Westminster Abbey. Coronations have been held here for 900 years and we know a little bit I think about what it might look like. Certainly I think we can expect a more modest, definitely a more diverse and probably a shorter ceremony than previous years. The palace though making it clear there will be tradition, there will be pageantry but that it will also look toward the future and in in terms of what that means, well, I don't think it'll resemble uh, the Queen's coronation here back in June 1953, which saw 8,000 people packed into the Abbey for a service that lasted three hours. However, there will be, as we know now, some core elements of that service. The King will be anointed with holy oil, he'll be breath blessed, he'll be consecrated, and he'll have the crown of King Edward placed on his head. The Queen Consort will also be anointed, and she too will be crowned then. But don't forget, the king was just four years old when he came to the Abbey to watch his mother's coronation. And I think the challenge for him now will be how to make this centuries-old ceremony feel relevant to modern multicultural Britain, a Britain that is, of course, in the grips of a cost-of-living crisis. And lots of questions, of course, about the bank holiday. That's a decision for the government. But certainly, I think the cost-of-living crisis uh, will be very much in their minds when they look about whether or not there'll be an extra bank holiday for the event. Welcome back. With the Bank of England saying it will seemingly not extend its emergency support package, earlier in the programme I spoke to Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, who told me we don't need to worry about our pensions being affected by the economic difficulties. No, our pension funds aren't at risk. Um, some pension funds have taken some high-risk investments. What impact has it had on your mortgage? But I've never thought that my personal financial circumstances, but we could discuss yours as well, are... Well, my mortgage has gone up. Well, what about yours? Um, 
mortgage rates have gone up for everybody who has a mortgage, and I have a mortgage, but my personal financial circumstances, I don't think are um, ones to draw general you asked conclusions me about mine from. And, and, I, I did, and, yeah, and I answered, told you. And I've answered, and we've, we've both had mortgages that have go up, gone up. And so has your mortgage gone up now? All, 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 any floating rate mortgages have gone up. Has, has yours? Yes, mine has gone up. Um, Tamara is here with us this morning. Good morning, good morning, thoughts? Morning. So Jacob Rees-Mogg is saying pensions are not at risk. Don't worry if you've got a pension fund. This is in response to Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, uh, saying yesterday in Washington, in really blunt terms, that the Bank of England's intervention in the bond market is coming to an end this Friday. It won't be extended and saying to investors you've got to get this done, basically saying the ball is now in the government's court to, to restore confidence to the markets. What does the government need to do? Well, we know that the Chancellor has got this statement at the end of October on Halloween to try and uh, balance the books and show how the government is going to get debt falling. That means really, really difficult decisions on spending. Jacob Rees-Mogg wouldn't comment there on whether he thought, uh, for example, benefits should be raised by the level of inflation. If the government don't do that, they could save a few billion pounds. We know today that the government has announced uh, an intervention in the renewable energy market, which is... Uh, quite uh, tortuously explained in their press release, but basically most people are saying it amounts to a windfall tax, essentially, on uh, green energy, uh, which has uh, been produced at a lower rate than gas, and therefore uh, they have had a bit of a windfall over the last few months. So that will make a few billion pounds, but that doesn't mean that difficult decisions in relation to the public sector won't have to be taken. We know the government will have to find £60 billion, pounds according uh, to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and where the axe will fall is going to be the subject of heated debate in government and, uh, of course, uh, discussed on the Tory backbenchers as well. OK, for now. Tomorrow, thank you. Back now to the escalating conflict in Ukraine, joined by Ukrainian MP Lisa Yasko. Hello to you, Ms Yasko. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. You are presently in uh, Strasbourg, aren't you, in France. Tell us why. Uh, good morning. Well, today and this week there is a parliamentary se uh, session of the Council of Europe when we are going to vote for the resolution on the Russian consequences in Ukraine and uh, that atrocities that uh, Russia is currently committing in Ukraine. So we are working very hard to make everything possible that as many countries as possible recognize Russia as terrorist state and that we create a real humanitarian solutions that will protect the human rights and uh, will make sure that we have the exchange of the war prisoners, release of political prisoners. There is a lot to be done this week here in Strasbourg. Who's listening? Are, are people uh, open to what you're saying? Definitely. Uh, but, uh, you know, the world used to be very different be before this war. And sometimes we lack mechanisms how how can we do it because yes there are different monitoring missions there are resolutions but you know when we vote for them in the end russia doesn't care which means that in the end it's all about the military support and inventing completely new uh tools of uh, providing security to the world order right now this is what we are doing this is what the, is the role of ukrainian delegation right now because we know it uh, better than anyone, what does it mean to live uh, with the war and what exactly should be done to make sure that other countries also don't get into this terrible aggression from Russia. Our spy chief here in the UK yesterday made a speech and said that he, we would know before there was any uh, major concern about the use of nuclear weapons. Does that offer you comfort? Well... Uh... No, I don't think it can offer me a comfort because um, the threat of nuclear war is very, very high. We understand that Putin uh, doesn't have any logic anymore. It's uh, not possible to justify Putin anymore. We understand that he is in his final battle of his life where he wants to prove to all the world that he can do whatever he wants, including taking lands, uh, uh, killing thousands of people, uh, destroying infrastructure, and we are... Uh, we understand that nuclear uh, threat and, and strike is, is very possible, but it's not going to change a lot on, on the scene of Ukraine. Of course, it's a disastrous, it's a catastrophic. Uh, for me, 
it's a big tragedy uh, to see thousands of people b- being killed, uh, wounded, uh, destroyed lives. But it's not going to change the will of Ukrainian people to restore justice and to restore our territorial sovereignty. We know that um, your uh, leader, President Zelensky, spoke to the G7 leaders uh, yesterday by video link. Um, What do you think he took out of that? Do you think he is getting, or that you're all getting the support that you so desperately need from the wider world? Well, I'm sure that every speech of Zelensky is very much needed right now because it absolutely reflects the needs and, and, and the mood and the situation inside Ukraine. I know that sometimes some Western countries, they are just far and they don't feel the urgency, which is in, incredibly frustrating for us because, you know, we don't have time for discussions. So we are screaming, we are trying to, to, to do everything possible to defend uh, with our uh, weapon, our people every second. And, you know, having this kind of discussions that uh, last long uh, for us, of course, it's not something that 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 is bring brings us lots of uh, happiness. But of course, I'm very happy that there is a connection and a communication bilateral and with the G7 and uh, with the different formats uh, on a daily basis, even often. This is. This is very important. Very important. Mm. Yeah, this is very important. Okay, Uh, we must let you get back inside and carry on with your work. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Ms. Yasko. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. The family of Muriel Mackay, the murdered wife of Rupert Murdoch's deputy, are urging police to launch a new search for her remains on a remote beach after the discovery of a long-lost confession by her killer. According to a letter hidden among old court files, Arthur Hossain told his solicitor he buried her body at... Jaywick Sands near Clacton in Essex. It's believed uh, the information was never followed up. Let's get more, should we, because uh, Martin's standing by for us. Martin, what more do we know about this story? It's the latest twist in a very long and tragic saga, Um, but it shows that the family of Muriel Mackay still has hope that uh, they will be able at some stage to find her her remains after after all these years. Um, they think that this might be the most positive and hopeful clue so far. Is this the last resting place of kidnapped victim Muriel Mackay, remote Jaywick Sands on the Essex coast? 53 years ago, Mrs Mackay was held for ransom by two brothers. They were later jailed for her murder she was never seen again. It's now emerged that one of the brothers, Arthur Hussain, claimed he buried her on Jaywick Sands. His solicitor revealed the killer's confession in a letter to the appeal court in 1972. He said he told local police. But author Simon Farker, who discovered the letter hidden in legal documents, doubts anyone followed up the information. As far as I can tell, no police officer was ever given this information. Um, There was no visit to see Arthur in prison, either by the police or by that solicitor. This is the only piece of paper amongst thousands of pieces of paper which actually name a possible burial place. Mrs Mackay was the wife of newspaper executive Alec Mackay. She was abducted from their London home just after Christmas in 1969. Her kidnappers mistook her for Anna, the then wife of Rupert Murdoch, Mr Mackay's boss. Earlier this year, police reopened the case and searched the Hertfordshire farm where the Hussein brothers kept Mrs Mackay prisoner. They found no trace of her. I learned to live with it a long time ago, the loss of my mother and the way it happened, so I don't really want to go on and on forever. But if someone's willing to have a quick look, or a proper look, for us on this huge area, Maybe that's a good idea. There's no evidence that any police have ever searched here for Muriel Mackay, and certainly her family were never told of the solicitor's letter, nor, it seems, were detectives on the case. And today, Scotland Yard is reluctant to start a new search. The officer now in charge of the case has dismissed the claim as one single strand of intelligence, With the killer and his solicitor dead, he said he can't validate the information. 
Martin Brunt, Sky News, Essex. The family itself has organised recently some <clears throat> basic scanning of that beach area, but it's a vast area uh, and they've had to give up. Um, they have heard from the police. The police clearly, as you've seen in my report, uh, do not believe that the information justifies a new search, but the family continue to hope that they'll change the minds of Scotland Yard officers. OK, Martin, thank you. The British Medical Association is warning that the NHS is in danger of complete collapse with senior medical professionals planning to leave. A poll by the organisation found that more than two in five plan to leave the NHS in the next year. Uh, with pay uh, and pension tax arrangements, some of the reasons they planned to leave. The poll found that 44% of hospital consultants plan to leave over the next year. Amongst consultant surgeons, it's even higher. Half said they plan to leave in the next year. And nine in ten consultants also said that the pay rise they received this year was inadequate and unacceptable. Joining us now is the Deputy Chair of the British Medical Association Consultants Committee, and that's Dr Shanu Datta. Hello to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme this morning. Um, talk to us in more detail, if you would, please, about this survey um, and how seriously you think the government might be taking it. Good morning, Kay. Uh, this survey uh, was conducted in August. It was a survey of uh, 8,000 consultants in England, and it will make very uh, depressing reading for anyone who's interested in um, uh, getting our health service back uh, in shape. Um, uh, as you say, um, the figures are really quite stark. Uh, about half of consultants said that, the, um, that they would wish to leave the NHS or at least take a break in the next 12 months. And that figure rises to more than half for specialties like consultants, uh, for I beg your pardon, for uh, surgeons and uh, anaesthetists. Nine out of 10 said that the 4.5% pay award that the government awarded last time was um, uh, totally unacceptable or uh, uh, in inadequate. Uh, and I think this reflects the uh, state of play in uh, consultants um, in terms of um, the low morale, feeling undervalued, uh, and um, represents a very stark reading indeed. OK. Talk to us about the pension tax trap. I know that Kwasi Kwarteng hinted at that during his mini-budget, and I have heard the Prime Minister talk about it as well. Perhaps you could explain it to us in more detail. So, um, uh, alongside pay and working conditions, uh, uh, pension taxation and a tax trap uh, is another reason that uh, doctors, senior doctors, uh, are being um, uh, are taking the decision to uh, retire early or to cut cut their hours. Uh, the government did announce some sticking plasters, uh, as we could describe it uh, in recent months, in terms of allowing some doctors uh, to be able to continue to work um, and and claim what's called partial retirement. Um, but that is simply not going far enough, and it won't stop the exodus of, of the most senior doctors. What needs to happen is that the, um, uh, the unfair uh, pen taxation of pensions uh, needs to be uh, uh, removed. And the way to do that is to uh, alter the legislation that underlies uh, pensions in the Finance Act. Um, at the moment, consultants, uh, like other people, uh, get tax relief for their pe pensions. And instead of that tax relief, what the BMA is saying uh, is that um, uh, the uh, pension taxation should be removed instead so that uh, the relief would no longer be a factor uh, in that taxation. So what would that mean? Would that mean that as a result we would see more consultants wanting to, to work for longer within the NHS? So the number of uh, consultants um, who um, are, are cutting hours and leaving the NHS has tripled in, in recent years. The average age of consultants retiring is uh, approaching something like 59. Those changes would mean that consultants could stay on longer and work for as long as they needed to or wanted to in the NHS, rather than being driven down uh, uh, and driven out of the NHS in the current way. Excuse me. Um... Have you had any contact at all from the health secretary? 
we are uh, we are in the process of contacting the health secretary, and we'd like to meet her to talk about pay, to talk about pensions, uh, and we're also concerned about the working conditions that have got worse and worse um, uh, in the NHS for for consultants. Let's remember that consultants are the most senior doctors in hospitals. They tend to be the people who lead their clinical teams. They're responsible for teaching the next generations of doctors. They lead on research, uh, redesigning their service, and innovating uh, the health service. So these are. Uh, people who the health service can ill afford to lose. OK, it's good to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. <clears throat> also still to come, the winners of the Photographer of the Year Award 2022 have been announced following a series of stunning submissions. It's the 58th year of the award and contenders will be displayed at the Natural History Museum. Uh, this, can, I'm sure we can show you this photo that was actually the winning photograph. Um, it, so you have to have a quick look, a close look, I should say. It depicts a snow leopard. There you go, hunting. Can you see him? There he is, bottom left-hand side, about a third of the way up your screen. It's a great picture, isn't it? Well, joining us now is the man who took the photo and the winner of the Mammal Behaviour category in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year 2022, Anand Nambia. Hi, how Hello. are you? It's I'm nice doing good, to Kay. see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Tell us about the photo. So this photo was taken uh, in North India uh, in a place called Spiti Valley. Mm -hmm. um, we were tracking the snow leopard uh, since morning and the snow leopard uh, spotted this group of ibex. Uh, and, and it pretty successfully stalked uphill from the ibex, and then it, it and in this photo, it's kind of chasing them down, trying to bring one of them down. So did it catch them? No, it didn't. It okay. Didn't. <laughs> uh, how did you capture it? So I was standing in in the opposite cliff face. So this is happening. So this there are two parallel cliffs. So it, this was happening on on the on on the cliff face opposite to me, and I'm standing on the other side of the. Cliff. Very difficult to see, aren't they? They are very very difficult. Okay. Very very tough terrain. Yeah. Uh, high altitudes. So you had to train, challenge. didn't you? You had to have, have a fitness regime. Yes, I mean I'm I'm generally a bit bulky, so <laughs> I had to kind of train uh, in the months leading up uh, to my uh, trip uh, to these to these areas. Okay, so. we all have our winter coat on. That's fine. <laughs> um, so, what is it particularly about snow leopards that you wanted to capture on film? So I so I I have I have a passion to photograph nature, and and in India you have. Uh, Tigers, you have leopards, you have Asiatic lions. Uh, snow leopards has always been the, the holy grail in terms of photographing cats. And it's been my dream at least for a few decades to see one, right? Yeah. And, and to have a moment like this happen in front of you, it's, it's, it's really, really Some lucky. of the pictures actually while we're talking to you, obviously they thought that this was the best. They're all going to be shown, I think, in the Natural History Museum? Yes. Is that right? Um, what, makes, what makes a good photograph? So uh, I would say that you need to captivate or engage a person looking at the photograph. Uh, a good photograph would uh, spark curiosity to a bit, know a bit more. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Symmetry is awesome. Uh, it spark the curiosity of that person to learn a bit more about that species or, or that landscape. And hopefully that, that curiosity would then lead to uh, empathy and, 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 and support to kind of keep okay. that intact. Okay, I think we've got a picture of a whale coming up um, as well. Uh, tell us um, how you heard that you'd won and how you felt. So, so they, they disclosed the winners in March, but we were told to kind of keep it ah. uh, strictly under wraps. Wow. Yeah, this, this is the winning image, so this is a wonderful image of these. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, been, it's been six months where, well, we had to kind of keep it a uh, secret. Uh, but yes, I mean, it, uh, absolutely elated to know. So what's next? Well, uh, I'm, I'm planning a few more trips uh, early next year. Uh, so hopefully some good images from there as well. Yeah, and that, I'm guessing you'd like the symmetry on that one as well. That's wonderful, that's isn't wonderful. It's a beautiful photograph, isn't it? Beautiful. What sort of camera do you use? So I use, I use a Nikon uh, with, a, with a 500 mm. So I have a range of uh, lens Lenses and cameras. Of you do. What did you use for the one with the leopard? So it's a 500 mm lens with a Nikon okay. uh, SLR camera. OK, that's a great picture too, isn't it? Welcome wonderful. home, wonderful. or not, go, go somewhere else, I think, if the birds were in your house. Um, <laughs> it's great to see you. And um, you. when are they up at the uh, Natural History Museum? From Friday. Until? 
I'm not sure about that. A long time. A long time. And this is your image. Yes, which is that's absolutely right. superb. Thank you so much for taking you, the time Thank to you join us. Much. Absolutely love that picture. My son's a big fan of snow leopards. I know that he'll very much like it as much as I do. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Thank Thanks you, a lot. Uh, what does Jacob Rees Mogg think about mortgages on the increase? How much is his? Find out. Top of the hour.